feel good. Feel all right. So there's a scripture over in Third John. And it says this. I wish above all that you would prosper and be in health. Somebody say health. I need you to repeat after me. I am supposed to prosper and be in good health. Even as my soul prosper. Did you read that too? So Dr. Melissa Cleveland is coming. And I need you to understand something. That when she comes to minister in the area of health, it is for our benefit that we may grab hope to longevity so that we can live long enough, healthy enough, in quality, so that we can continue to pour into and plant the seeds of life back into the family, one grain at a time. And so I want you to listen carefully those things that you can do and change, let's do them and let's change them. Dr. Cleveland, come at this time. Let's give God a praise for. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, let all that have breath praise ye the Lord. So we're going do a, a little educating today. How about that? How does that sound? All right. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to line up. Y'all got some act right for the act right. Mm-hmm. I'm talking to this computer because it ain't doing what I want it to do. And it needs to do right. It needs to behave. What they say? It needs to submit. There we go. I got it, sir. Thank you. See, they, he always got my back. Always. Amen. Even when I don't think he has my back, he has my back. I wouldn't trade them for nothing in this world. Nothing. All right. So today, uh, okay, I, I ain't have no mic up. So um, the month of May is considered to be mental health awareness. And here in the African-American community is kind of taboo. We don't want to talk about it. We, we feel like if we don't talk about it, it'll go away. But I'm tell, here to tell you today that it's, that's not the case. If you don't talk about it, it gets worse. And it gets passed down from generation to generation to generation. And so that's why we, as African Americans, need to be more knowledgeable. We need to be more proactive instead of reactive so we can take care of our own community and won't have to worry about somebody else taking care of us. So what we deal with is a battle of the mind. 
Romans 8 and 7. I'm going to get deeper into that a little bit more in a little, a little while. But the battle of the mind, that's where we have most of our problems is we fight with ourselves. As they used to say, uh, well, show on TV back in the day, you have an angel over here and the devil over there. You know, that's quite, quite honest what's going on sometimes. We don't understand why we will want to do this, but then we go and do that. So hopefully today we can get some understanding about how we need to go, go about uh, when it comes to things of that nature. Okay? So how do we support the unique mental health needs of the older adult? Because as we age, we're going to experience life changes uh, with our mental health. You know, as you get older, you may stop forgetting uh, or start forgetting things, uh, maybe one or two things. And, and it may progress to be a whole lot of things. And then uh, uh, you don't remember anything after that. And so how do we support people that may be going through that? Well, it's never too late to get help, first of all. It's never too late. And it's, again, it's important to remember that older adults, they have a different, they have different mental health sy symptoms than a younger adult. For example, example, they might not be interested in activities. You know, you got these two over here on this front pew that like to play softball. And so, as they get older, it may get to the point to where they don't want to play it anymore. And that's the favorite thing for them to do, but they don't want to do it anymore. So that's a, a, a symptom that you may see in an older adult. Talking about mental health to older adults will allow them to feel a little bit more comfortable, you know, uh, allow them to be like, okay, well, I don't have to keep this to myself or for instance, I, have, I talk about my mom all the time, God love her. She'll sit there and she'll talk and she'll be like, you remember, you know what, I forgot what I was going to ask you. I said, well, it's okay. Well, I ain't forgetting a whole lot, just the little bitty things. <laughs> and it's okay to acknowledge that little things you may be forgetting. Amen. Mental health treatment. Uh, can be a part of a wellness program to help the older adults uh, live a happy and a fulfilling life. Also, mental health professionals can help older adults cope with those life changes. So if they're going to the doctor or going to see a therapist or going to see a psychiatrist, they can uh, help them deal with that, give them um, the information that they need so that they could better have a better understanding of what's going on in their life. Friends and family uh, can experience meaningful mutual connection by spending time with that adult. Oftentimes, what, uh, as an older adult, uh, as they get older, uh, their friends may pass away, uh, the family has moved away, and they find themselves by themselves. <clears throat> And so when they find themselves by themselves, it, get, it becomes depressing. They want to know where everybody is. They're not used to being alone. And so it's, good, it's a good thing for, for the family and the friends to gather around that older adult, not just at a birthday party or at Christmas or at Mother's Day, but Sometimes you need to go there in between time and, you know, to see them, to keep them up, keep them, uh, their mind uh, fresh. Also, uh, things that help older adults is what they call uh, these crossword puzzles, things like that. Giving them something to do will help keep their mind active. Therefore, they will not uh, start forgetting as much stuff as much. Also, mental health is very important. I don't care what age you are. You can be two to 102. Mental health is important. 
Spending time with your family and friends, again, can help boost not only your mental health, but it can uh, boost your, um, your physical health as well. Now back, back to talking about the kids, as I said, from two. Helping teens, children and teens, build a resilience build a resilience uh, and self-care strategies and skills for managing life stressors in many in healthy ways. So how do we do that? Well, we got to support the family. We got to support the community. We got to have good resources in the community so that the teens and the children will know where to go, where they can get it, and to keep them out of trouble, keep them from getting um, in gangs or getting around individuals that mean them no good. And what happens is they will get around these other people, get under certain influences of maybe drugs or alcohol or both. And what those things do, it starts messing with the chemical imbalance in the brain. And so this is going to have those teens or children doing things that they should not be doing. And so when that happens, the main thing that we have to do is we have to teach the children and the teens coping skills. We gotta, gotta find a coping skill. What are we gonna do? How are we gonna do it? Okay? We need to know the signs and symptoms of mental health issues when it comes to teens and children, because early diagnosis can save lives. And that is in reference to um, bipolar, paranoid schizophrenic. If there is a history of that in the family, they need to get to the doctor ahead of time because they know what that signs and symptoms, what it looks like. So that's why early diagnosis can save lives. Start the conversation earlier. You know, talk about mental health with your children, you know, with their teens. Children, middle school, all of them, from five all the way up, they're, they're really mean. Kids are mean. I'm just going to be honest. And they don't care what come out their mouth or how it come out and what it sounds like. So we need to talk to them early. Especially if we have a child that's in school, they may start getting bullied. And you don't know what's going on with that child. That's why it's important to have that conversation with them. If, if you have a bully, let me know. If someone's picking on you, let me know. Make them comfortable enough where they can tell you what's going on in their lives. And then you got to nurture your relationships and the environments that these children are in. We have to. We got to show them what good mental health looks like, okay? And we got to show them how to manage life stressors in healthy ways. I mean, you have some students that um, they will... We have some students, students, children, um, they'll start cutting. Yeah, they'll start cutting. And if, if you're a parent and you're not paying attention, you won't see it because they'll have long sleeves on all the time or a jacket on or a hoodie on or a sweatshirt on. But if you have them to raise their arm, they have cut marks. And they cut themselves all the way because they're stressed because they're scared, because they're going through something. They feel like they can't talk to anybody. So that's the only release that they can get is cutting themselves. It's so very important that we have good mental health. And it increases the ability of the children and the teens to practice self-care and to face challenges uh, with resilience. Now, another area where mental health truly needs to be examined more is uh, recognizing the importance of maternal mental health among pregnant and postpartum people. Y'all giving birth, 
that's the next thing next to dying because you get so close, really close. And you have all these hormones that are raging. You have all of these emotions that are going on. And when people are pregnant or, or postpartum, everybody thinks that it's okay. Um, everybody wants to come over. Everybody wants to see the baby. Well, what about the mama? How you doing, mom? Are you doing okay? That's the questions we need to be asking. The baby fine. As long as they crying, pooping, and eating, they good. But how is mama doing? We got to start paying attention to our mothers. They have so many emotions. They get overwhelmed. You got the baby over here crying. You got the husband talking about he wants something to eat. And you got them other three kids just, just doing whatever. Mama tired, y'all. Depression will hit quick. Anxiety. There, those are some common symptoms of postpartum. And they affect new parents, old parents. This could have been your 10th child. Guess what? Postpartum will hit. Because now you got nine plus one more. What you going to do? How you going to get them to go to work? Daycare now, they cost too much. It's cheaper for you to stay at home. But if you're the only one making any money, guess what? You got to get up and go. But that postpartum depression affects any age, any gender, any culture, any race, and any income level. It don't matter. Just like a bullet don't have a name on it, postpartum depression don't need it. Many of these people feel symptoms will go away on time. No, that doesn't happen. If you feel like those symptoms have gone on too long, you know, it's okay to ask for help. It is okay. Because unaddressed mental health can lead to pregnancy-related death or an unintentional harm to the, to the mother or the baby. So we need to make sure they have proper self-care and make sure they're seeking help when they need it. And that, that's going to help them to maintain good maternal health. So we have unique challenges, uh, strengths and contexts that can affect mental health from people in any particular racial or ethnic minority group. Everyone deserves to be respectful and have culturally appropriate care. What you talking about, Dr. Cleveland? That makes no sense to me. I know that there may not be enough African-American psychiatrists um, therapists, psychologists, but what I'm saying is you should not have to go to Joe Blue over here and he tell you to get over it versus you go to Dr. Cleveland and, you li and she listens to you and tells you what you need to do or help you come up with a plan to do the things that's going to benefit you so you will be better, so you will feel better, so you will be able to do better. Cultural differences can be respected and celebrated when providing mental health. Mental health providers are encouraged. There, are such, there is such a need for mental health providers. It, to, it, is, it, is, it doesn't make sense. I don't see how as many people going to school and many people are graduating and many people as many people are getting a degree in psychology or something close to it as many people are going to med school to become a psychiatrist why then is it so hard to find a culturally competent health care provider why so we need to address those issues, address the barriers to treatment, and start trying to build more, a more equitable health system. Because together we can, all, we can improve the access to mental health care for racial and ethnic minority groups. So what if somebody wants to talk to you about, about their mental health? What you going to do? 
First of all, you need to let them finish their sentence, okay? Let them complete the thought. Don't interrupt them. And after they finish, then you can respond. Now, so you're going to respond. You're going to let them know you understand. Now, if someone just spilled the beans, spilled their guts, poured them all out to you, and you've gone through something similar, tell them. It's okay. It helps a lot for someone to know that someone else is dealing with what they're dealing with. Just make sure that you don't make it all about you. Okay? It's not all about you. It's about them. They came to you. You need to listen. You let them know you've been to something uh, similar. So now what you need to do is keep the focus on them. Avoid being judgmental. That's just not nice. Don't tell them that they're being crazy, that they're being weird. That's not going to help anyone. You're going to shut them down, and that might make them go to a very dark place, and that is not what we want. You need to take them seriously. Take them seriously. Try not to respond with statements that minimize how they're feeling. That's not good. We're not going to do that or what they're going through. You j oh, you're just having a bad week. You know, oh, I'm sure it's nothing. I know this person, they've been going through depression for a very long time. And they tried to talk to their family. Their family was like, oh, you'll get over it. Oh, you'll be all right. The depression that they were, go were going through was not a just a regular old common bread variety depression. It was what they call generalized depression. So what they did was they, when they went to the therapist, they took some pamphlets that they had and they mailed them to their family. And their dad called and he said, I understand now. Sometimes they don't know. Sometimes it, they think it's the same as, oh, when grandma passed away, you know, I was a little depressed, so I got over it. No. It's not like that. You got to take them seriously. And make yourself available to them. Make them available. Make yourself available. Let them know if they need to talk again, they can call you. They can. We go to coffee, and I'll pay for it. I love me some Starbucks. Mm-hmm. But let them know that you're, you're there for them, that you will help them deal with what they're going through. And you don't take what they've told you to, uh, as gossip. First lady, let me tell you, that girl over there came and told me that she's going through this. Ain't that a mess? Don't do that. That's, first of all, it's not nice. That's not Christian-like. You know, we want to get technical. What would Jesus do? Would he do that? No. If you don't understand some of what they're going through, if this person comes and talks to you, do your research. Maybe Google is your best friend, okay? Hit the Google. Type in what's going on. Google will let you know. Oh, I understand that. That makes sense. Now I know what to do. And children... A few of you younger adults that are in here, if you don't understand, tell an adult, especially if someone is talking about committing suicide or things of that nature, get, a, get an adult involved because we don't need to lose not near one of, of you guys to a senseless act as that that could have been avoided if someone would have talked to them. Okay, they came and told they came and told me what they were dealing with. Now what? What am I gonna do? But you, what, you gave me this information. Now what do you want me to do? Now what you want me to do? Well, things might be a little bit awkward for both of you guys, but you're learning them; they're learning you. You'll probably feel relieved. Whew, I'm so glad I talked to somebody. I don't have to hold it all in. Yeah. 
that they're going to feel relief. Then they may encounter, you may encounter someone who doesn't understand. So what do you do if that happens? Well, you just let them know, I don't understand, but I'm here for you. Whatever you need, I'm here. I can help you. And it's possible you don't get the reaction that they were hoping. They don't get the reaction that they were hoping for. Oh, all right. Talk to you later. Bye. I got to go. After they just sit and spill their guts to you. But one thing about it, the conversation, that was the first step in the process. The conversation is the first step. And so if that was your first conversation and it's not with your parents, you'll probably need to talk to them next. Children, older adults. You might, need, might even need to set up an appointment with a therapist. But I, what I want you guys to take from this is that it's going to take time. This is not no overnight success type thing. It's, it's going to take a little bit. What do you mean? A couple months, maybe. A couple years, maybe. It, it's just going to take some time, and I can't put a number on it. So how respectful dialogue can reduce mental health sti stigma? First of all, we got to understand that people matter. Words matter. Are you using culturally, racially aware language? Language matters in compassionate care, and it's not limited to what you say in front of, what I may say in front of a patient, what I may say behind closed doors to friends, coworkers, and families. That can be the main seed of the stigma that we see in mental health. So what are we gonna do about that? Well. We got to reinforce the purpose. We got to create a space where uh, they can share their concerns and their feelings and, uh, and comments. That's what we have to do, reinforce that purpose. We got to open the conversation with a personal story and engage others. Share how your experience impacted you and e invite others to do the same thing. Set up agreements. I didn't understand this. When I was taking psychology in my nursing course, they would always say, set up an agreement with, this is when we went and did our psych rotations at Bryce. It's closed now, but Bryce Hospital in Tuscaloosa. Whew. That gives me mm -mm, flashback. But when, you, when, it's, when we're talking about psychology, if you make um, an agreement with them, especially with somebody that may be suicidal, say, I'm going to call you back at 3 o'clock on tomorrow. You're going to answer the phone. They'll say yes. As long as you keep making those agreements with them, they will, they will m be, make that appointment. And sometimes you have to keep doing that over and over and over until you can get them to someone that can, that's trained to help them. Sometimes you may have to do that. And bring the conversation to a close by thanking them for sharing it with you, okay? And encourage them to think and uh, how they need to act and the impact that it can have on their lives. So ways to approach someone that may have a uh, mental health condition, talk to, to them in a space where they're comfortable, where they're likely uh, not to be interrupted. You know, ease into the conversation. Make sure you speak in a relaxed and a calm manner. Make sure you show that you're caring. Communicate in a straightforward manner. You know, stick to one topic at, at a time. Don't jump from here to yonder. 
you know, be compassionate, be respectful. Make sure the conversation is about them and is not about you. Be a good listener and make eye contact. Ask appropriate questions without frying. Give them an opportunity to talk, uh, share some insights. You want to reduce uh, defensiveness by sharing your feelings. You want to speak at a level that's appropriate. And be aware of a person uh, becoming upset or confused because you don't want that. Really? You don't want to work that way? So, I'm trying to move on. Okay. I'm frustrated right now. I'm going to leave that alone. In 2 Peter 1, verses 2 and 3, grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus, it's not on it, and Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life, godliness, through the knowledge of him who has called by his own glory and excellence. Here we see that God, through Jesus Christ, has provided us what we need in every aspect of our lives. Okay? In every aspect of our lives. So some of the great news that we have Darling, go to slide 15. The next one. Sorry. Keep going. Uh Uh-uh. There you go. So, the Bible's answers to mental health and emotional health. The Bible is very clear. God tells us that in this world, we're going to have troubles. He didn't deny that. But what what he tells us to do in that time of trouble, that's what we need to be getting. He tells us in the final days that there will be increasingly difficult and troubling times. And y'all, I think we're in that time now. Been in that time. He gives us a clear understanding as Christians that we're going to face trials, temptations, and troubles. Yet God says that we can live and we can have peace. We can. Second Theologians 3.16. Now may may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always and in every way. The Lord be with you all. Psalm 4 and 8. I will, I will both lie down in peace and sleep. For you, Lord, make me dwell safely and securely. Psalm 55, 22. Cast your burdens on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be moved. He won't allow that. And John 3, first and 2. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you. And that you may be in good health, even as your soul is well. So some other scriptures that can combat specific uh, health challenges. Let's look at that and how we can beat the enemy. When it comes to fear, 2 Timothy 1 and 7. For God did not give us the spirit of fear, but the power of love and a sound mind. Okay? Deuteronomy 31 and 8. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. So regardless of what you're going through, what all that's going on around you, don't be afraid because God is there. Don't fear for I redeem you. I have called you by my name. You are mine. We are God's. 
We are God's. And knowing that right there, that's enough. That is enough. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you my righteous right, with my righteous right hand. Got depression. Like I said, people have depression. But the righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from their troubles. Psalm 34 and 17. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will praise him, my Savior, my God. Mm. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 and 4. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Father of compassion, the God of comfort. Who's, who comforts us in trouble so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Did you hear that? Did you understand that? So, if God comforts me, that means that I can comfort any of you because I got my comfort from who? From God. Y'all, look at that. So that means that whatever our friends, our family may be going through, if you believe in God and God is comforting you, that you can comfort them. We can help each other stop a whole lot of this mess that's going on out there if we take our time and do what the word says do. Psalms 41, 40. That, uh, chapter 1, 3, verse 1 through 3. I patiently waited, pa I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit of the mud and the, and the mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth. A hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Y'all, did he not give uh, my husband a new song this morning? He gave him a new song, y'all. Okay, we can beat this thing because we got God in our lives. Anxiety. Everybody has some of anxiety at some point in time. I remember the first time I got up here and had to talk to y'all. My anxiety was way up there. Now, don't get me wrong. It ain't gone. It's still here, but it ain't where it was. Philippians 4, verses 6 through 7. Be anxious for nothing, y'all. Nothing. And I'm talking to myself. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. That was for me today. I don't know about y'all, but I'm receiving that right there. Because, yeah, that was, my, that was for me. Jeremiah 29, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Young children, I don't care what you're going through. God got you. He going to give you peace and he give you a hope because that's what he does. John 14, 27. Peace is what I leave with you. It is my own peace that I give you. I do not give it as the world does. Do not be worried and upset. Do not be afraid. Okay, so that's a different type of peace. God has a different type of peace. Okay? A different type. A whole different type. We can't even comprehend it. Now, I think this is going to be my little last slide. You go, ooh, baby, I done, I'm, I'm sorry. I done gone on. Keep going. <laughs> gone on. All right, right there. Come back. Uh, back up, back it up. 
to the exclamation point. There you go. I'm sorry. Y'all, I be trying. I get, it gets so good, and I get excited, and I forgot to tell him. Galatians 1 and 10. Am I trying to win the approval of men or God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. Okay, so God asked a question. Are we trying to please men or God? I'm trying to please God because men can't do nothing for me but hurt me. That's it. But God can take everything in this dirty, filthy body of mine and make it perfect through him. Psalm 1832 is God who arms me with strength and makes me my way perfect. It is God. First John 1 and 19, if we confess our sins, he is faithful just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I, and I'm, I'm going back to this a little bit. I'm going to be done. I'm going to wrap it up. Scripture is to combat perfectionism. You probably think, what do you mean? What is perfectionism? That's not a problem. Yes, it is. It is a real issue. Uh, it's called OCD. Uh, yeah. It's a real problem. People think that they can't do anything unless it's perfect. And they will keep doing everything that they have to do over and over and over again until they feel like they can get it, get it per, uh, perfected. But that's, that's, there's only one perfect thing, one perfect being ever in life, and that's Jesus, and he died on the cross. So they're, they're running after something um, that they will uh, never get. You know, obsessive-compulsive disorder is real. It is real. Then you got bipolar. You got schizophrenic. You got depression. You got so many mental illnesses um, nowadays. I'm like, okay, where did that one come from? That's another one I've never heard of. So just, just know if you have somebody dealing with this, talk to them. Help them out. Encourage them. Hopefully they can go and see a therapist or a psychiatrist. So I'm going back to the battlefield of the mind, Romans 8 and 7. The sinful mind is at war with God. It does not obey God's law. And those who are controlled by their sinful nature cannot please God. However, the verse also says that the Holy Spirit controls you and that the Spirit of God lives in you. Romans 7 and 23, but I see in my members another law wa waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. God can fix anything. You just got to allow him to come in to be fixed. Here I have some mental health resources. Uh, if you need them, don't be afraid to come to me. I will gladly uh, give them to you. If you know someone who needs them, um, let me know. I will gladly give them to you. We as African Americans, we have to stop being afraid. What goes on in my house, stay in my house. And that can take me down another road that I don't need to go today but we need to try to heal each other, people that are going through these uh, mental health issues. That's all I got for y'all today. <laughs>